it sort of appeals to every generation still. You just can't not look at it, can you? It is an icon, I think. You just realise it's got immense power. It's immense power. It's, it's a timeless thing. Tremendously important. But it was fantastic. It's stunning. The noise sounds like the end of the world. Britain. It played its part tremendously in combat and even played a part for the people who were left at home. The British people began to view the Spitfire as a symbol of British excellence, of defiance to Hitler and a real indication of the prospect of victory. At the very least, it was a great morale booster. But for the few who risked their lives to fly her and alongside her in the hurricanes, the view from the cockpit was much different. The period of apprehension is, is when you're waiting, watching the build up of the enemy. 50, 60 miles away and realise that there are 200, 300 aircraft and they're going to come your way and you will have to fight them. 96-year-old Wing Commander Tom Neal joined 249 Squadron when he was just 19 and was first equipped with Spitfires that later flew Hurricanes in the Battle of Britain. I had the pleasure of speaking to Tom on the telephone to hear of one of the last remaining first-hand accounts of an RAF pilot in the Second World War. We didn't have any sleep at night because there were bombers over. We'd be shaken into wakefulness every few hours. Sometimes we slept between the wings, under the wings of our aircraft. And then the worst, the most intensive periods during the battle. Uh, sometimes I flew two, three, four, five times a day. But no, you were, you were never frightened when the fighting took place. Uh, you were apprehensive before the event. You were excited during the actual fighting. And then you were relieved when it was over, really. But uh, we were young, very young. Don't forget, the average age of my squadron was 21 and a half. The Spitfires are said to have stolen all of the glory in the Battle of Britain, but Tom explains the important partnership between the Spitfires and the Hurricanes. Two thirds of us flew Hurricanes and one third of us flew Spitfires. And the Spitfires, because they were a little quicker, they engaged the fighters above us and we engaged the bombers slightly below them. But that again, in attacking the bombers, uh, we laid ourselves open to attack by German fighters. And whilst we were attacking the bombers, the German fighters would slip in behind us and attack us in the hurricanes. Tom flew 157 times in six weeks during the Battle of Britain and came out somewhat unscathed with only one parachute escape. And yet he insists he was just ordinary. Don't let anybody fool you into believing that we were very special people. We weren't. We were very ordinary people. And the aircraft was very, they were very good, aircraft, very reliable. Like so many who fought for their country, Tom is extremely modest. But he is as highly regarded today as much as he was all those years ago. He is one of six remaining Battle of Britain pilots that Winston Churchill talked about in his famous speeches. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. But we can't forget that without the people behind the scenes, the pilots wouldn't have such great aircraft to fly. The late Geoffrey Quill was the second man to fly the Spitfire when it was first produced. He 
He started out as an RAF pilot, but moved to Vickers Aviation and went on to succeed Mutt Summers as chief test pilot and flight tested every single variant of the plane and the Seafire. I met his daughter, Sarah Quill, at the Imperial War Museum, London, where six boxes full of her father's logbooks, lecture notes and memories are held. My mother told us uh, that he was going to be flying over the house at, at a certain point because he was either taking a Spitfire somewhere or on his way perhaps to an air show. And I think I probably would have been about four, but I always remember going out and waiting out in, in the garden and in the dry, knowing that it was about to come over, and, and then all the grown-ups saying, oh, you know, it won't be for another hour and a half or something, and then hearing this sound of the Spitfire uh, approaching, and he went over the house and, and he did a roll, which I think you're not supposed to do, probably, um, and we waved wildly. So that was my first memory. Jeffrey went on to make significant changes to the plane, which contributed to its great success in combat. But Sarah admits... I didn't really know any of these things until I read his book. No, he simply didn't talk about... If, if he did talk about the Spitfire and the war, it, it would have been in a very removed kind of way. And of course, when it's your own father, you don't appreciate it all till it's too late. This made it a special journey for us to uncover some of his achievements. From reading his books and papers, he was an extremely passionate person who devoted his life to the Spitfire and went above and beyond in everything he did. I think he was accepted as a pilot officer at the age of 18. Um, and then his next, the thing that I think really led to everything else was the, um, the meteorological flight where he had to fly, you had to fly pretty well 365 days a year uh, in all weathers, uh, reporting back on cloud cumulus and weather conditions, and it was very, very tough. And uh, for that, he, he was awarded the Air Force Cross. He went back briefly into the RAF during the, for the Battle of Britain. He was absolutely determined that he was going to fly in that, because he knew that unless he actually flew in combat, um, that, that, that was the only way uh, in which to make m modifications uh, and see if the, the aircraft really worked. He, he had to be both brave and careful, I think. Um, so, and, but they got him back fairly quickly, sooner than he liked. He would have liked to have gone on. Uh, 1943, 1943 to 44, and he served with the fleet air arm. And that was to uh, develop better carrier deck landings uh, with the Supermarine Seafire, which was the naval version of the Spitfire, because uh, they had been suffering very serious losses in deck landing accidents. His test flying came to a tragic end when he fell unconscious during a flight. Twenty years later, in 1966, Geoffrey made his last flight. He writes, as I climbed out of the cockpit of AB910, I felt the sadness of bidding farewell to an old and trusted friend. World War II ended on September the 2nd, 1945. 544 aircrew died in the Battle of Britain, and afterwards a lot of people fell silent. But many of the future generations have devoted their lives to keeping the memories alive. These are two RAF officials here, filled with a German bomb. So this is our little main hall. This is Aiden. Just getting ready to join the army. Jeff Nutkins is an aviation artist and founder of Shoreham Aircraft Museum. It all started with my father, funny enough, and uh, he was he would have always wanted to be an artist, but he couldn't. There was no such thing as a job in art when he was a youngster. But Dad was also ex RAF and he flew with a 180 squadron. But he also saw all the air battles over Plumstead in 1940. So he just used to describe vividly these aerial combats he saw as a young bloke. 
and where they crashed, etc., and whatever happened. People coming down in parachutes all over the place. Just by chance, we came across the Chillum uh, Aircraft Museum. I said, look, they've just found this last year, this, this hurricane. I said, these planes must still be under the ground from the war. <laughs> so I said, we ought to find something. So that was the seed of what actually happened. And so from that moment on, we were very interested to talk to the older generation about what, what they've been doing. Jeff has gone to great lengths to make sure that his work reflects exactly the scene that took place all those years ago and in the process has had the opportunity to hear some amazing stories. So I started to paint the air battles to go with the bits in the museum and used to go to the ends of the earth to get the details right. We had an incident up the end of the, end of the village, a German Dornier bomber crashed at Castle Farm. We was knocking on doors to, say, to try and find anybody who witnessed it and we met a chap called Reg Hewitt and he was a young kid when this thing crash landed and all the crew got arrested and um, he said, I said, you haven't got any bits of it, have you? So he said, yeah. And he lifted up the, the garage door and he had an undercarriage indicator gauge that he'd pinched out the aircraft, <laughs> all covered in cobwebs. He said, would you like this for the museum? I said, oh, yeah, lovely. You know. So we started talking about it and um, then I traced the crew in Germany and um, I never met them, but I used to write to them. They used to write via one of the crew member's daughter and she ended up coming over and staying with us. So we had all, everything dead right, everything was correct, all the numbers, etc., and what they were doing and the angle they come in. And and then we we got in touch with the guys that shot it down. So we got all their colours right and uh, the right time of year. And oh dear, it's a lot to find out. So the, the thought was that when we're all gone, then hopefully these, these things will carry on. And that these people can say, oh, that is right, you know, that's what they look like. Even the Queen has a set of Jeff's paintings in Clarence House, but it's clear that isn't the most memorable moment of his life. We've had some massive garden parties here where we've never really thought it through, but we've invited the Luftwaffe guys over and the RAF guys were here. And there's been loads of friendships um, formed in the garden here. It was magic, but listening to their conversations is what starts off the pictures. Um, but these men... At then, well, they would have been in their 80s, I suppose, or whatever, late 70s. We've only ever met one Nazi in all the years we've done this. And it was a bit odd, really. But everybody else has been like a flyer and uh, just keen to meet the opposition. Like, oh, this is Oblaunt and so and so, he shot you down. <laughs> oh, nice to meet you. All <laughs> sort of thing, you know. But it's I wouldn't have missed it for the world. It's been a great hobby, you know. Southampton is home of the Spitfire, where it was born. So, of course, the Sonant Sky Museum also holds some special moments between their four walls. There was a, a little lady came in quite recently with her granddaughter. And this lady was very petite. And obviously, as a young girl, she was a petite girl. And because she was so small, her job working on the construction of the Spitfire was to crawl through the back of the fuselage and tie a couple of wires together ready for the radio to go in at a later stage. And she said there was a foreman who would always try and chat up and get off with a couple of the girls. And whenever I was down at the back, he would wang some of the elevator cables so they'd hit me. And he said, well, I'll stop doing it if you come out with me. And she said, I'd never go out with him because he was a bit sleazy. However, she said, there was a Belgian test pilot who was all suave and nice moustache and brilliantined hair, real handsome devil. And she said, oh, I remember going out with him. And her daughter, who was quite well-to-do, just looked at her mother and said, Mother, you went out with him? And this lady just touched her hair and said, Well, it was before I met your father. And she just gave me a slow wink. And little stories like that. It's not the Battle of Britain fighter pilot stories, but little, the minutiae of people who worked on the aeroplane. Because without them, the pilots couldn't get them in the air. Steve Alcock, manager of Solent Sky, takes all sorts of people around the Aviation Museum. And even though they have many different types of aircraft there, he always finds that people are always eager to see the Spitfire first. I deal with schools and youth groups, and I had a, a Cub Scout pack in, in the museum. And the first thing half the kids said to me was, where's the Spitfire? But these are eight, nine-year-olds. So this is four, five generations on. Oh, they know what the aeroplane is. They look and they go, whoa. And there's lots of whoa when they look at it. And a lady said the other day, 
it's ever so pretty. And she was a lady, you know, about 60, with her husband. And her husband blurred at her. So you can't call it pretty. And I said, I know what you mean. It is. Aesthetically, when you look at the aeroplane, it's right. It looks right. And yes, it is pretty in its way. But I wouldn't want to be an enemy pilot with this pretty aeroplane having a go at me. After hearing so many people describe to me what the Spitfire means to them, it was only fair that I got up close and personal with one and see for myself what the fuss is all about. Welcome to uh, ATC at Home Day. And we're inviting people in to get close to the aeroplanes, close to the people that operate them. Um, and we hope then that everybody in the round benefits from, uh, from what we're doing. Historic Aircraft Collection restores and operates a collection of military aircraft. And when they're not flying them at air shows, in the winter, they invite the public to have a special experience with their planes and even have an opportunity to sit inside the cockpit of a Spitfire. So to climb in, mm -hmm. you need to be very careful of the door on this hinge. Yeah. You can very easily catch your foot on the, on the hinge when, on the door when you go in, which would damage the hinge. So yeah. you can put your one hand on the front of the bulletproof screen and the other hand you can put on the bulletproof panel there. Okay. Please don't put your hand on the canopy itself because if you put too much weight on that, it, it'll flex and it could crack it. Okay. So if you stand up, okay, so one hand there, one hand there, put your right foot on the, on the top of there, and stand up, mind, careful you don't catch your toe of this foot under this door, okay. there is a tendency for that. Stand up onto the seat, that's it. And you can and step forward, on the seat. step onto the seat, that's right. Both hands there as you've got, and you can lower yourself down onto the seat then. Oh my goodness. It's absolutely tiny, isn't it? But there's a lot going on inside for there such a, a inside, small yeah. area. And it's quite a snug fit, really. It is, just a <laughs> And tad. as you see, looking forward, yeah. you can't see a thing. You can't see very much at all. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, this Spitfire was static in the hangar, so I could only imagine what it was like to fly in such a confined space where I couldn't see what was in front of me. Howard Cook, who is a ground volunteer for the company, has been lucky enough to fly in one. It is the most prized seat in flying. What you will see sitting in the cockpit is 10 feet of Rolls-Royce Merlin in front of you. Now, you're looking at a Spitfire, it's got twice the power of a Formula One car. Now, a modern car engine, let's give you an example, something like a VW Polo. That's about 1.3 litre. Okay. To give you an idea, the Spitfire's engine size is 27.6 litres. So you imagine 20 VW Polo engines all joined together on the front of an aeroplane. You imagine taking the silencers off those cars and then opening the engine up. You imagine 20 of your cars without a silencer in front of your ears six feet away. <laughs> now I'd been flying the Chipmunk and the Tiger Moth, then the Harvard, and I was signed off on all of them. So I was about as most prepared as I could possibly get. I taxied out up to the runway and with these aeroplanes you zigzag along because that's the only way you can see round the nose and then you call up the control tower and you say our, our registration is Mike Kilo Victor Bravo now if you look at the letters for that that's Mark 5B ready for takeoff and you think god I've just got a Spitfire ready to go open the throttle and it gets so loud open the throttle a bit more and I think I've hardly got any boost now, boost is the power of th that the engine's generating. So I'm up to about three. I don't want three, I want seven. So I open it right up to seven, and the noise is huge. And by that time, I'm off the ground in five seconds. Put the brakes on, then off. So you stop them spinning, change hands, and then you press down the lever. Press down, 1,000, 2,000. Then you lift it up, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And then let go, and your wheels go up. You bring the throttle back, you bring the propeller back, climbing at 140 miles per hour, and you think, what's next? Oh yeah, <gasps> ah, breathe. And then look out to the wing, because it's just you on your own, and no matter what happens, nobody can take that away, then climb away. Over 20,000 Spitfires were built during the Battle of Britain, and today there are only around 50 left that are still airworthy. With companies like HAC willing to restore and bring these planes back to their former glory, we could see the Spitfire in our skies for years to come. But considering the average Spitfire will set you back a couple of million, not everyone will have the opportunity to fly them. So the next best thing is the Spitfire experience.
Okay, well, the first question is, have you told um, anything like this before? <laughs> Never. Well, let us start the engine and just get it ticking out. So all you do to start the engine is a tiny little red button, push it and let it go. Push one to let go. Yep. As you walk up the drive to Brian Smith's house, there is an average looking shed in the garden. But when you step inside, it's quite far from containing the average tools you'd normally find. To the left, you have the front half of a Spitfire with three massive television screens lined up in front of it. And to the right, you have a setting that replicates a wartime office, equipped with a black cable telephone, logbooks and uniforms. The shed contains a Spitfire simulator where anyone can come and have a go at flying the icon. But it doesn't matter whether you have got no, as you saw that lady just flying it. I mean, she's really good and it's not difficult to pick it up. But as a chap came the other day, he was a big burly bloke. And when I said to him, are you a pilot? Nah, he said, I drive trucks, you know, great big bloke. And he just about fitted in it. But he had the lightest touch and he flew it around. But it was quite funny because he was like a natural. We want it to be as authentic as it, as it can possibly be. And we've recently upgraded the visual because it's quite important to have the visual but also the feel, so that you get someone who's a Spitfire display pilot, he can tell us whether it's right or wrong, and we can adjust the feel through the computer. So we had a former Luftwaffe pilot come, and uh, he came with his RAF friend, they'd met you know, at a reunion of some sort, uh, in their 90s. Um, the RAF chap flew the Spitfire first, flew it around, and then the Luftwaffe man was there, and his grandson was with him and he said, come on Grandpa, you can do this. And he said, yeah, okay. And he crashed it. And the grandson, who was about in his mid-twenties, said in a loud voice, Grandpa, he said, no wonder you lost the war. He said, <laughs> only his grandson would say that. Yeah. After spending the whole day watching people take turns at flying this, I was told the next person booked in comes every week without fail. My name is Nick Griller. I'm, uh, I'm a lifelong um, enthusiast of anything to do with aviation. Well, I, I'm a frustrated non-pilot. I, I, I suffer from uh, illness called Parkinson's and my coordination is very bad. So flying has helped a lot. So therapeutic. And it's fantastic fun because if you make a mistake, no, no one gets hurt, unlike the real thing. It's the ne ne next best thing to fly no, the real air 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 aircraft. Okay. Uh. 80 years on, and we are still celebrating this magnificent aeroplane. But when there isn't anyone left to tell the first hand accounts, will generations to come still be interested in such old machinery? This year, I attended the 80th anniversary of the first flight of the Spitfire. I was able to stand on the runway and watch the aeroplane fly straight over my head. But I wasn't as lucky as one young cadet, 15-year-old Edward Gray, who had the opportunity of flying in the helicopter for the best seat in the house to watch the fly past. Um, so our air cadets, uh, when this was decided that we were going to have uh, us push the aircraft out, um, and then one person from that list was chosen to fly in the helicopter, and I was just the lucky one, extremely lucky person. Surreal is probably the best word. Um, you can't particularly describe it, it was just absolutely amazing. I mean, you could practically touch the Spitfire, it was so close. Um, pictures, weather, sun, it was absolutely amazing. It, it felt, you were there with it and you could, you could almost touch it, it was amazing, absolutely amazing. I, I think it's so important, so important that something with so much history, stories and people that have worked and, you know, piloted these, these Spitfires and, you know, rest their lives for our country, it's just so important, so important. Uh, it's such a beautiful aircraft, um, it's just absolutely amazing. The Spitfire is still touching lives even today especially for the current youngest Spitfire pilot in the world, Nathan Forster. Flying the Spitfire has an extremely important meaning to him. I was awarded a scholarship programme to fly the Spitfire. Um, it was for injured service personnel, so I was in the Army. I didn't fly in the Army. I was uh, 
yeah, just injured in Afghanistan in an explosion when I was serving over there. And then um, as part of a rehab thing, I, I went up for one flight in a, in a little microlight and I knew I was totally in love with flying then, it's what I wanted to do. And it was a um, project set up by Bolby Flight Academy and the Endeavour Fund, which is the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry's charity. So they funded me through all of my training, mirroring the um, the training the guys had in World War II. So I owe a lot to the Spitfire and a lot to the, the people around the Spitfire. Um, the guys at Bolby, Prince Harry and the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and, and what they've given me. So it did totally turn my life around the Spitfire, but it's, so it's, it's great to pay homage to it 80 years after its first flight. The Spitfire holds resonance with many, many different people. And when speaking to the people I've met along the way, I have asked them all of the same questions, but not one, two people have given me the same answers. From people who fought in World War II, to people who just saw it fly over their house, to youngsters who learned about it from their grandparents. They all have a different and important story to tell. I think just a timeless icon which brings a lot of joy to people's lives and represents something great about Britain. It really is. You feel it all through your your blood, <laughs> your bones. 